it's all right. Okay, wait, hold on. We're there. We go. We're in. We're on. We're live. We're here. Hello. Oh boy, let us know if you can hear. Uh, also, like, um, go over to the to the Twitter thread, the X thread, and let me know if you like the new thumbnail format. I looking for something a bit more eye catchy, alluring thing. Vote, vote on the <laughs> poll if it's good or bad. And if it's bad, I please send me your suggestions. I'm trying to uh, trying to get that uh, that sort of doubt. Um, and I'm I'm happy I was able to do the show today because I I lost my voice Tuesday. Um, girlfriend got sick and then took care of her and was all set to go to a, a really wonderful book show in Toronto and uh, I, I caught what she had and uh, uh, didn't want to risk giving it to anyone else there especially some authors that were going to be meeting for the first time that I've been following for a while and so I, I stayed in and then Wednesday my voice was so sore I couldn't speak <laughs> so I did the normal lemon tea honey and all that type of stuff Right. Didn't work out too well. I mean, the other symptoms gone, but the sore throat and everything, not being able to speak, that was not coming back. And then Thursday continued up, but by afternoon, no improvement. I just emailed my doctor and I said, can you get me in on Friday? And then 20 minutes later, they're like, yep, sure. We got a spot for you. Come on in this time in the morning. Went in. Good deal. Yeah, I'm, I'm very fortunate. A lot of doctors in Canada don't have, aren't very organized. So that's why they have those wait times in their clinics or their own practice. Mine, I've known him for 17 years. <laughs> he's, he's a contemporary, gotcha. he's very organized. It's like if, if well, I needed to... if you run to into s- trouble too, you can contact me. Yeah, but I mean, I just to the point where it's like, if I need to go see see him in a pinch, he's scheduled right. enough where he can let anyone just come walk in and he's, you're good. Like most you'll That's have to wait cool. is like 30 minutes because he's... He's very efficient. He's like, don't BS me. Just tell me what's wrong. <laughs> and, well, that's and a sign of a good doctor. We don't go in and sit for two hours. Oh, yeah. No, that, I mean, I was, I, I was on, um, my previous physician was um, a recommendation from my dad's physician when I was living, you know, in, as a teenager at home. And then when I moved to the Toronto area for college and then before I left for LA, <laughs> I was on a wait list for a local GP, but I had my original one back home. So I'd have to commute like two and a half hours to go see them for regular, you know, checkups and whatnot. But it took six years to get off the waiting list and get this physician. I was very, very lucky because he was around my age. And he's like, no BS type of stuff. He's like, all I'm here to do is make sure I don't have to see you regularly. Like, that's his goal <laughs> for all of his patients. I like that attitude because... Good man. You know, a lot of his patients um, don't need medication. And they're, as they get older, I'm 39. I'm not on any medication to help with any of my... any Because I don't have any health problems. So I'm like very, very fortunate. And I'm just going to keep listening to his advice and and all that type of stuff so i'm very fortunate there and his his latest treatment works just a couple of like you know vitamin c some b12 and anti-inflammatories and bang my my voice is back for there tonight's show for everybody here so and i'm glad it is because i that would have been terrible to miss this one yeah i'm, I'm kind excited. of i'm kind of kicking myself that i shouldn't have done an early, day earlier but also at the same time i'm canadian i don't like to bother people uh <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, yes. Uh, so let's get into the, the show, the show itself for all you guys out there listening. Welcome to Scripts on Saturdays, the only screenplay review show on the interwebs discussing scripts, both professional and amateur, circulating around Hollywood, giving you, the TV and movie-going audience, a behind-the-scenes and inside track on what writers are pushing and what producers are buying. I am your host, the Script Doctor, and joining me this week is Adega. Welcome back, sir. So happy to have you here tonight. You know what? I have to tell everybody, because I am very happy to be here. With this script, I kind of think you like me the best. <laughs> <laughs> when people hear about this, oh yeah, yeah, this, this I like this. Yeah, we've got um, we've got a we've got a comedy, um, a comedy that's a comedy. Yep, which is really one. important. Uh, the last uh, couple we've had, uh, you know, have some funniness here, some not not so much. Um, this one uh, is by. Uh, a writer that actually has an, an existing credit. Uh, her name is Sarah Rothschild. She has a credit. Uh, she wrote a screenplay in a movie that be- was called uh, The Sleepover. It's on Netflix. came out a few years back. That, too, is a comedy. Uh, this script that she wrote was um, ranked number 44 on last year's Blacklist which with 10 votes, which um, is interesting because I think the previous script didn't have a whole lot of vo- votes as well, and that was a lot higher. That was um, right. Strange. 
that had 20 votes, double the votes, but is at number nine. And we didn't like that script. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> so this one here, uh, it's called Chaperones. Uh, the log line is a single dad tries to bond with his teenage daughters by chaperoning, uh, teenage daughter, sorry, by chaperoning her field trip only to have, uh, to save the world and possibly her virginity when an accident evil is unleashed. Uh, Adega, could you please regale the audience with the synopsis? All right, here we go. Peter McGuire is a recently divorced landscape architect who worries that his 15 year old daughter Cora is slipping away. In an effort to salvage their relationship and get to know her better, he volunteers as a chaperone on a field trip to a museum park. But his preoccupation in trying to watch and connect with Cora leads him neglecting the other kids he should be watching, and they end up releasing a demon that will kill them and all and possibly take over the world if they don't stop it by sunset. Can Pete save the world and his relationship with his daughter? These are the responsibilities of being chaperone. Uh, well put, sir. Thank you. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, um, I, when I was first, uh, when I first sent out the script, because I, I booked you for the day bef and the script was already picked, and I looked at the page count, I'm like, oh, it's 120 pages ish. <laughs> like, this, is, this has got a, a, a length to it. I was like, I hope. This is good, and it doesn't um, bog bog you down because that's always the worry. Whenever I have you know these co-hosts on, it's like oh, if the script's over a hundred. If the script's a hundred pages, that's a sweet spot. But once you start getting close to that one twenty mark, like that's where you're like, mm, this is, might take too much time out of the day. So I was a little concerned about that. However, I found this script read well, really well, like really quickly. What were your yes. thoughts? No, I completely agree with you. Uh, the first one I had done with you was um, the divorce party. And that was shorter, and it felt shorter, but other times it felt really long and bogging. This one felt even shorter than that. It just it clicks. Boom, boom, boom. It rolls really easy. Uh, I found it written really well for the most part, you know. Uh, so, like, I didn't find any spelling errors in it. Neither did Everything I. Everything <laughs> made sense. You knew where the setting was. You knew what the people were doing. And you remember the, the note that I first caught off, it immediately started catching on to these tropes and cliches and things that you've seen a thousand times. And I thought, you know, uh, here we go. But I liked it. I'm going, as odd as that is, I liked it. So, uh, nah, it was it was quick, easy, nice, nice. It really, it really was because I was, I mean, this was written last, this may have been taken longer to write, but it was essentially written last year. And it's um, funny. Like, it, it's... Yeah. Legit, you're like, wow, this is not, these aren't um, dated. I mean, some of the jokes are, are specific to like the relationship between parents and children, and they do right. draw a little bit on current day technology, but it's not as heavily dated or politically driven type of humor or socially driven type of humor. It's just, oh, let's, let's latch on to the awkwardness of what it's like to be a parent and technically, regardless of all the books out there, not really know what the heck you're doing. 24 7 right right <laughs> and, and see and i think it was that. part of the reason why it made it so quick for me too is being a parent and having kids and, and actually doing a chaperone which i'll probably talk about later mm -hmm. um it, it caught me in yeah and, and the other part too i mean this is this is two tiers of coming of age coming of age a little bit for the kids yep. i mean it, it's played down a little bit because they're not the focus and i think that's to the script's strength and then the coming of age with regards to a parent's like, okay, accepting your situation, accepting your responsibilities on a grander scale, like understanding what it what it means. And I, I think these are really cool themes that are throughout this script, which is about growth. It's about accepting change and, and growth. Uh, and I, I think that's a great, I mean, if you're dealing with messages, that's a great message to throw in your, into your script because it's a very general one. It's not pushing any type of specific thing it's just saying yeah guess what the world changes we have to change along with it we can accept what changes will benefit us and we can i recognize what ones won't and what we stand for on our principles but if you you know it's like that rocky speech you got to roll with the punches right <laughs> and yes. and that's what's yeah. really being going on here uh so I'll, I'll i'll give the audience a little bit of context so we have pete mcguire who's the you know 40s dad with a dad bod he's a landscape architect um 
I love the opening part of this part because I want to skip the, the the supernatural aspect in that one page first for the moment and gotcha. get straight to Pete because he is the he's holds this movie up. He it's all on his shoulders and he's um, yes. really fun. And the way he's introduced is he's dri- driving along a neighborhood and the neighbors are all saying, "Hey, how you doing? We like you. How, yeah, we're you're great. Nice yep. to see you back and stuff." And you're thinking, "Okay, this is a nice white picket fence set up." Pulls into the driveway, talks to Megan, his wife, and. It's revealed that nope, this is his ex-wife. He's divorced. He's here to pick up his kid. Um, they they have a daddy daughter night for like a date night thing. Uh, go see a horror movie and and hang out. And we we get really subtle aspects of the fact that the wife is out there gardening and she's overwatering plants. And pa- Pete is basically saying, "Don't do that. I planted them here specifically for this." Blah blah blah. And we quickly understand that he's very knowledgeable about groundskeeping and and the layout of things without it being like blatantly told to us through the script or, or through some sort of like lecture or any other type of thing. He's basically saying, I'm concerned about the, the plants you're overwatering, <laughs> you know? And I, I like that. Uh, I thought it was a very, very clever way because it feels like a non-important aspect of his character. And, and it also is framed in a way that this might be a little bit of the conflict that leads to why they, these two are divorced. Uh, and I thought it was really well done. It was effectively, effectively, um, effectively conveyed on the page for me. I agree. It was uh, it smoothed really, really easy into learning who these people were. The thing that got me, you know, the setup was nice. He, you're getting oh, this is a nice guy. Even his wife likes him. Uh, ex-wife likes him. Here comes Brody. Uh, Brody is the new love interest and I, and then this is where I almost started to get a little irritated with this because Brody's a young baseball player with the Cubs and I'm thinking yeah really a young baseball player built like he is everyone drooling over him and going with a uh, divorced lady with a 16 year old and then it started hitting me oh this is a comedy that plays very well okay I like this yeah <laughs> and they don't make Brody a jerk. They just no. He's he's just a guy there trying to be he's trying to be amicable. And um, I like how the stepdad of Brody introduces Cora to us. Uh, it's not you know the mom calling for anything. It's like you know Cody. He's done a, raw, a run. He's recovering from a, a sports injury before he gets back into the main season. As he heads inside. He basically calls out, you know, his stepdaughter. Hey, your dad's here to come pick you up, and then boom, that's how, how Cora arrives, and we get this really tender moment where, she's trying to tell her dad that she's got to stand him up tonight because her friends, uh, made plans, and right. I'm like, damn, that's it works really well. Like I was like, oh, I totally know those situations, not just because of, um, you know, I I've been a kid where. I forgot I had plans with like my dad for one day and I made plans that morning and my dad was like, Oh yeah, sure. Go with your friends. Um, and it always bothered me cause it's like, no, I kind of wanted to do both that somehow do both at the same time, but couldn't. But in this case right. here, they do a little bit of a twist, which is like, no, she really much would rather be with her friends, but she still loves her dad. And I'm like, okay, I get, get that part. Like the conflict is not that she wants to do both, which was what I would relate to as a human being, but it's for, it's the fact that this is a 15 year old girl in high school, probably very popular, probably self-centered to a degree. No, she cares more about her friends going out than right, anything else. Right. See that also, it made me very grateful that I am a father of three boys and not a girl, because I, if I was that dad, I would have caved instantly, even though she was, I kind of think she was playing him the way that I yeah, think me the too. author was telling it. it was not this, you know, oh, I'll change my schedule, Dad, because I love you. I think she was just playing him. It was poker, and she won that. It yeah. was poker. She won. But then we got this great reveal, which is um, her best friend drives up in a car, and the dad yep. knows her first name, says, oh, you got your license, I see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She's like six <laughs> times a try. It's like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and I can immediately relate to that because – uh, you know, but it was got to be eight years ago now because the oldest one is 24 and he did not get his license the first four or five times. Um, and he's a very good driver. He's actually drives an ambulance. Uh, but <laughs> just, oh, geez. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's probably I think it was more politics with regards to like the, the tester and the fact gotcha. that he looked like a very privileged person at a point of time when he wasn't. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I just remember joking about 
that with him where he was pulling up to my place to um to pick up uh, his godmother at the time after he just got his license and this is before we we broke up due to traveling different parts of the planet actually and she was going he was going to drive her to um to the university uh because we didn't have a car at that at that particular time anymore it um died on us and i had to sell it for parts <laughs> and then i had to go shop for another one so i was commuting uh, we were both commuting by the bu- by bus and taxi and because uh, this was before uber existed mind you so this tells you how long ago this was this was happening and uh yeah when she tells me oh yeah this you know our godson's coming to pick me up he's like wait what he's got his license now <laughs> she's like he's fine you know he's a good driver check my insurance <laughs> and then he like he you know he pulls up into the into the driveway of our apartment and, you know she goes with him i'm like if she doesn't come back to me i'm going to kill you if you if you live this like uh, it's like just all those funny types of things but i you know everything was fine of course afterwards but yeah i completely i was like i am so in pete's shoes right now in this scene i know exactly what he's talking about i mm-hmm. i get the joke you know, you see someone you love who gets into the car and they're being driven away by someone who you're like, Ugh, it's like significantly younger than you and with a lot of responsibility. And you just feel like, ah, I really want to be a part of that to make sure everything goes OK. Right. And the boy in the back of the car. Oh, and the boy in the back of the car like that. I I, I was fit, grateful I didn't have to deal with that, that on the <laughs> same level as like my best friends who are parents of my goddaughters. But I mean, you always get a little bit of spillover <laughs> when it comes to right. to that. But yeah, I mean, I just like the fact that he knew the, all the kids' names except for the strange boy. Um, it was effective. It, it also conveyed to me, it's like, oh, here's a father that actually pays attention to his daughter, even if her daughter doesn't, if his daughter doesn't pay much attention to him. Like, that's cool. Right. That's how you convey a good parent or at least a, a parent that cares, whether or not they're good at, at it or not. Subjective, of course, but a parent that cares, I think is a good parent. <laughs> Exactly. So, I mean, th- this is the the establishment that we get here. We understand. Okay, he's disappointed. He, you know, he goes back. He, he goes. We get this great scene where he goes to the movie theater that he'd already bought tickets for, and he goes to see a horror film. And he's talking at the screen, and I'm like, yep. oh, I I like that. I like the fact that he's like, don't go in there. You know, jump scare. And he's like, nope. Spills his popcorn. I'm, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought about that too, and I go, "Oh, he would have toughed it out if the girl was there." I gotta, yes. I gotta stay here to impress my kid. But yeah, <laughs> it 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 was sad in a way too, though, thinking that he went regardless, even though the girl wasn't there. It just it seemed like there's it, it painted an impression that the hole that was in his life was bigger than just her not being there with him. It was. Uh, it, the attachment was he was starting to lose the attachment it was there was the date was no longer there they were scheduled boom 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 but she's growing up and it's like you said it's a coming of age thing and a growing thing where now he has to realize well she is different now and the movies mean something different now uh, but uh, again i thought he would have stuck it out if she was there but i thought that was hilarious nope i'm out <laughs> yeah I, I i liked it too i I mean, I've been in bad movies that made me do that. Not never a scary movie that made me do that, but it it just made him really relatable. It's like, oh, he's got nothing. He doesn't even have like a girlfriend. Like he's right. he's all alone. Um, he he's doing the the movie stuff. I guess out of habit because it's probably it's their thing that they do. Yeah. And and then we get back to his apartment and we see, oh, he's a workaholic. We've got blueprints and and diagrams and models and stuff of his landscape architecture job all over the place. Like it's just cluttered with it. And he just wanders into his daughter's room, you know, reminiscing, seeing the the fo- family photo on her on her, you know, table and whatnot. And then he finds her archaeology textbook, and uh, permission slip falls out. And he's like, oh, looks it over, and it's for this. Um, archaeological museum so for anyone don't know the peppered throughout the north north america are a bunch of museums that are built around an archaeological site Mm -hmm. um and these are fascinating stuff i love going to these things because the number i mean the the irony of it is that sometimes they build part of the museum over top something they haven't excavated or didn't think was there and then they find something there and so they have to basically read they have to open up that section of the building and then dig underneath it Uh, and that's always kind of funny uh, because you never realize how big some of these civilizations that have been lost to time to a degree really expanded, even in North America. It's always been fascinating. So she's got a permission form for this, and he decides to sign it, but then he sees a little 
checkbox at the bottom is like, do you want to be a chaperone? And he's like, you know what? I miss her. I want to spend time with her. I'm going to do it. And he che- ticks, checks it off, puts it back into the book, <laughs> sends her a text and says, hey, I signed your permission slip for your field trip thing. And then she just resp- responds with a thumbs up emoji or something as teenagers, Zoomers do. And I, I like the fact that he doesn't mention that he's going to be the chaperone there because he thinks right. it's going to be a pleasant surprise. And it's like, yep, that's the that's total dad thought. <laughs> Completely forgetting, you know, 18 years of their own life <laughs> from birth to, to adulthood of what, what it's like to have a relationship with your parents. No, no, they'll be, they'll, they'll think this is great. Um, and I love that. <laughs> No, it, it was it was good. Uh, which again, it reminded me because when I chaperoned my son, it was band camp for a couple of days, and I actually was cognizant of things like this. And I went there and I saw kids awfully embarrassed by the other parents that were there. And I, I decided, you know what? I'm just gonna stand up if they need a band aid, they get that. Uh, the rest of the time, I'm sitting in the corner. And when it all was done, my son came up to me and said. All the kids loved you the best <laughs> because I wasn't there to embarrass anybody. I'm going with my kid. It's not, no, I'm, I'm making sure you don't break your arm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I only got to do two chaperone things, but I remember more of the stories from my dad's chaperone and my dad liked to tell jokes and funny stories and just not be the center of the attention, but just get people involved. And so mm-hmm. he was always the favored of the chaperone parents from, from the kids because he didn't, he didn't care about judging or anything like that. He's like, oh, you're not having a good time. Well, we're going to make sure we have you have a good time. We're going to find out first what's bugging you, and then we're going to solve it and get you get you all happy and stuff. And it was really cool. So I was actually very fortunate whenever my dad would show up for a chaperone and I would do what I did as a kid up until my teenage years, which I just, you know, go give him a hug. None of my friends would ever make fun of me for that because, like, no, your dad's really cool. I totally get why you'd hug him every time you see him. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know. Um <laughs> So I, so I always tried to emulate that with my, my God kids. And there's one time where I had to do chaperoning for kind of like, it was, it wasn't a band camp, but it was kind of like just a, a hike type of thing. And cause the, the high school that they went to, uh, and this is their grade nine. So that'd be their freshman year, um, was built by a forest and then a lake and the lake was always sealed off because they didn't want kids, you know, swimming in the lake. But every, uh, early spring early around this time actually uh in the year they'd open it up for a couple of days and then parts of various classes would go through and there'd be the teacher and then three parents for chaperoning the whole the class of 30 so each parent each person had like seven or eight kids and the teacher would do the the tour and talk about you know nature and whatnot and it was really just to get the kids outside because most of the other athletic programs by this point had been expunged from from the schools <laughs> so mm-hmm. so i had to do that i did that twice uh, for my eldest godson and then my eldest goddaughter who was two years younger. And if they talk to you afterwards, it means you did a good job. Yes, it did. <laughs> um, and it was only the my goddaughter afterwards that talked to me. The godson, he was just like, it's kind of lame. <laughs> like he just doesn't want to be here. He, he was, uh, oddly enough, he again, he was the oldest one. So uh, he um, he was always distracted by other, other stuff. Uh, so every time I'd, he'd wander off, I'd have to be the guy that yells him to get back in with the group. And, of course, it's, it looked like I was bullying him a little bit because, I, because again, I'd yell at him like a parental figure or a guardian figure. I'm right, like, no. Right. It's like, no, I'm not worried about you. It's like, get back in here before I tell your dad or I get him to give me permission to smack you up something fierce. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> which I never had to do, but I, I, liked, I liked the threat. It was always entertaining for me. Um, but, yeah, like it was just yeah, you have to – Take take a huge step back, let them do their thing, uh, let them risk minor injury. I always would say, like if if it looks like they're gonna trip and fall on something, just leave them be, let them get up themselves up. But if it looks like oh they're gonna walk off a cliff, that's when you intervene and grab them and you know berate them for being stupid. So figuring that out was always was always fun. Like because I mean, uh, you as a father you you want to be involved and i and that's the thing that's going on with here with pete is he's trying to get right. involved right and it's so hard <laughs> as as a parent that my friends have told me and that you shares like it's so hard just to be like i gotta stand back right <laughs> yeah yeah well i you know i mentioned to you before i my parents were greatest generation so when they stood back it was way back you know it's like <laughs> well if your arm's missing, we'll talk. Um, 
but I, I found it interesting with the because we're talking about this aspect of chaperone. I I was just thinking they had the group of chaperones that came into the meeting. I don't know if we're jumping too far. No, I think this is this it, is fair because we're getting into like we kind of just jump right into the day of this is the day of the trip. There's school buses right. outside. We're in the um, we're in the main class. There's Mr. Truitt, who's this fifties fifty year old bitter history teacher. And then we meet, you know, the chaperone leader, Michelle, who is this Michelle. Asian tiger mom type for, uh, deal. And then you get Cam, who is this black guy who knows all the conspiracies and all the legends of all the terrible stuff. <laughs> so and it's like, funny. you, I mean, I knew that type of dad when I was a teenager yep. and seeing them on yep. chaperones. <laughs> um, and then you have Rishi, who is a dentist, a uh, very timid type of guy. And then we're missing one other chaperone who we we meet a little bit later, but those are the, the, the ones that we get off to first. And then we get, you know, they, now this is the thing I'd never seen before. So this must've happened right after my, my grandkids had left school and stuff where they have like these, they have drop off points, which are at school, which I've seen in, in movies recently, which is a thing, which mm-hmm. I thought is stupid. Cause it's like, don't kids walk to school anymore. Um, and then the other part is uh, these color coded chaperone groups. <laughs> right, right. Like, we didn't have that. You're like, you just have to learn the names of the kid and remember their faces and what they're wearing. <laughs> well, that's what's I more think important. Because the way they play, because I have seen chaperones just like these people. I, they're, they're, it's kind of authentic. They may be a little bit silly, but it's, it seems authentic. Mm-hmm. But I think it was organized. Didn't Michelle color? coordinate everything yes you've ran into people that are like that they're oh, yeah. the organization uh heretics or uh i i want to say the the n word you know with they're the, uh, they're incredibly overbearing i i knew one who the fascist after type, her yeah. children had graduated from that school would still be head of those chaperone things for and she had no genetic connection to anyone at that school as a student or for faculty just right. still there and it was hysterical because i i found this out through my dad who called me and he says i got the weirdest call today i'm like what remember this lady oh yeah she asked me if i wanted to chaperone <laughs> at the school i'm like does she have kids i don't think her kids are graduated they're in my class she's like yeah i don't know why she's doing this i don't have kids there why would i chaperone right. <laughs> and i'm like yeah right. what about the parents of the kids there it's like that's what i said but this is I want Michelle is that type of woman. Some, yeah. When I, I want to clarify something real quick. When I said N word, I meant the crooked crosses, yes, Lorresque type, not anything else. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I was not. I wasn't even thinking of that way. I was thinking more okay, of like just a dictatorship, sure, I, a dictatorship type of thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, not that. Of course not. <laughs> oh yeah, that'll. That's that. Yeah, every everyone who raised an eyebrow, I guess, can now lower it because we were talking about more of a <laughs> controlling aspect, not not any sort of derogatory. Gosh, yeah, exactly. But you no, know, you have those helicopter parents, those bulldozer bulldozer parents. Michelle is 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 exactly that. Like she gives everyone fanny packs with like epipens, inhalers, right. clear wipes, flashlights. Like technically useful stuff, but it just seems okay. It's a little, it's a little over overly cautious (laughs) but um yeah i I, the the way that she's brought in like she's got this whole like she's very patronizing to everyone uh you can tell her smile is not authentic she's just doing this to try and be around and i mean one of of the things that i've learned is that those are the types of mothers who don't have hobbies (laughs) or or parents there's a lot of truth to that absolutely yeah i've seen a few and that you nailed it right on the head it's like, well, my hobby is dictating life to everybody else. <laughs> yes, the hobby is my kid and everything around around them as well. I, I always am wary of that. That's that's why I haven't gotten married yet. Is I'm always making sure that the women I date have hobbies, so that if we do get get kid children, <laughs> it's like, yes, we can take a break from our hobbies to raise our child. But I really want you to get back to your hobby because <laughs> I don't want that kid to be broken. Um, and and uh, it's it's funny because I've actually. I, I've, I've met many people uh, on the homeschooled side of things, uh, oddly enough, who their entire life is their children and there's nothing else that they do. And I'm like, I'm very grateful that you're so attentive to them, but the child is literally on a leash about an inch in length. And there's, you, you can just see that they're, 
they're only trying to satisfy the the happiness of their parent as opposed to enjoy life as a kid. So it's just uh yeah. Later on, we're going to find out that stereotype. Yes. Of what happens with the kids? Is it on the money? I have seen it a lot, and I'm sure you have too. Oh, it, it's so on the money. I mean, and the thing, and what I really like about what the writer does is that she has fun with this character. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Like, it, it's not, she's not this antagonist for the sake of being an antagonist. There's a nice. There's a there's peppered little aspects to her personality that make you understand why she is this way. Uh, right, and, and she's also, which is not an obnoxious trait, a good trait. Most of them I've ran into have been obnoxious, but she is open for change. Yes, where a lot of them aren't. Oh no, that's exactly it. And the the reason being, and, and that comes to a reveal in the in the tail end of the second act, uh, which we'll get to there in a moment. But like Michelle, very interesting character, very good adversarial character. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I like how she's literally the opposite of Cam. And Cam has the same goal, which is he's protecting all the kids, but he's got all these stories. He's got stories about how on one field trip, someone wasn't paying attention to kids, wandered off, got down and busy. Nine months later, the, the daughter gave birth to a toilet baby. <laughs> yep. And he says yep. it like a teenager would describe these types of stories, but he's got this type of authority to him as an adult. And... I think it's hysterical, especially like he's got this great joke where he's he read he reads one of his son's text. He doesn't know what the heck he's saying, and he says, "I had to look up it. I had to look up these words on Urban Dictionary to understand what the yep. heck my son was saying." It's funny, Rishi and them all trying to figure out that one text. Go, yeah, the, it's unprotected sex. No, no, he's not. He's just talking about lying about something. He's like, nobody right. knows. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was good. Yeah, I, I have to give it to the author because uh, Rothschild, she she knows how to do comedy. That that was good. She she does, and I think it's it's to her strength because every every single one of these characters is coming from has their own goal. Cam's there because yes, uh, it's his turn. He didn't want to be there. He didn't want to be there. Yeah. It's technically his turn to chaperone. He loves his kid, but he's he knows his kid is stupid, <laughs> and he's paranoid. So he's looking at everybody, making sure everyone does stuff and he has no reservations about slapping a kid's hand away from something (laughs) like i know some parents are terrified to touch another kid but he's just like i don't care that kid's gonna get in something trouble i will smack his hand away from it to to make sure he's okay um and i don't think there's a straight parent and by straight i mean like consciously like not a clown parent a straight parent that would actually mind that (laughs) and then i love i also love rishi because he's very timid he's just trying to be a good dad and he's got a very dorky daughter but when it's revealed later on that his daughter makes tiktok videos where she's impersonating him and he's like i'm so heartbroken but she nails the impersonation <laughs> right he's got talent we gotta send her to school for that even though i'm embarrassed <laughs> even though i'm so embarrassed she's so good at that i got we, we're probably looking at content creation colleges or something in the future i'm like that's funny and also sad that there's content creation colleges or there would be but i mean you, you, there's just endearing natures about these guys um, these characters when it comes to their kid, like Michelle is so proud of her son, Sam, who's like honor roll student and he's taking college courses and stuff, but he's only like, um, he's only 15. So he's a sophomore. Yeah. And, and he was doing a, 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 a MIT thing too, as a high school. Something like that. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so we're getting these really well-developed characters in very, very little time. Like we're only really in page like 10 or 11 of the screenplay here. Yep. So dense information, but so easy to digest, easy to remember. Mm-hmm. And I like the fact that, I mean, it really does play into um, the aspects of the parent-child relationship. So the first one that I thought was really well done is when Cora comes in and finds out that her dad's chaperoning. And she's like, oh, this is so great, weird, awkward, okay. Yep. And it's like, yeah, I thought it'd be a surprise. <laughs> surprise? <laughs> and yeah, Great, thanks, Dad. And so she's like, I'll just go to my locker and get my bag and then I'll meet you on the bus. And as he's going out to the to the parking lot where the buses are, he sees obviously his daughter's best friend, Kelsey. And he's just like, well, which bus? And she's and she points to a bus and then he's like, "Okay." And he gets on the bus and then a beat passes. And then there's Kelsey and and Cora and they go into another bus. It's like, oh, I totally know that move. (laughs) It's like, I just don't want to be on the same bus as the as the dad. Yep. 
when she said she had to go get the locker, she was changing her color for group. She was changing the bus. Yeah, she went yes, to work. Yes, because this is something that I think has been consistent with all type of chaperones is that as the chaperone, you're if you're also there for your kid in the ki same group with your kid. So that's one of the reasons why they, they do the chaperones. They don't really like to put a parent in a group that's not supervising their kid normally uh, right. as well. But in this case here, the obviously, well, it was organized so that he would be supervising his daughter. His daughter has taken off the, the color code band that uh, would put her with her dad and replaced it with another one <laughs> to put her with someone else. Yep. <laughs> uh, which, again, Smart at that kid. point, nobody can really do anything about. Um, but then we get this nice little meet cute moment with uh, the laid back mom mother of Lindy, who is just trying to tell him, like, listen, you got to remember your kids, they're at this point in their life where they just don't want to pay attention to us anymore. <laughs> and. Right. And Pete, yeah, but my daughter's hanging out with this loser. What kind of name does a your parent give a kid a name like this? And <laughs> yeah. oh, I mean, it, it. I mean, it's it's a very obvious setup. It's a very tropey setup. Oh yeah, you know. And 100%. the thing is that they play they play it well. And I like how the fact that Lindy is kind of messing with him this entire time, because mm -hmm. as soon as he starts braiding, like, yeah, this this kid is supposedly dating my daughter. His name is Wilder. He looks like an idiot. And then Lindy's like, yeah, that's my kid. I named him after my dead father. <laughs> you know, just guilt tripping him also. Uh, and it's all a joke. Like, he's, it, it literally, she did just name him that because it's, and it, it is a stupid name and she acknowledges it, but she didn't actually name him after a father who's still much, very much alive. But yeah, like, she, she just does that. At first, though. Yeah, we she didn't know that. Sweat first. It out. She, she kind of made him sweat it out for the moment until, till, till some more stuff hits the fan. But, we find okay yeah we go on the bus trip when the two when lindy and pete get off it's like okay they're friendly they're having fun conversations it bothers wilder a little bit <laughs> when he sees this right and um now as he's trying to do conduct part of the tour with the tour guys we have, we have two tour guys and i think the context context of this museum is very important but it also raises maybe one issue but i'll get to that in a moment so the context is that it's a, it's a monday morning um the museum is normally closed on Monday, so they have a limited staff of really just two people. And the first one is, of course, Nate, the um, the park ranger of the museum. Yep. And then we've got Eve. And this part here, th there's actually nothing really wrong with it, but I thought, okay, Rothschild's here is really stretching her vocabulary muscles because she calls Eve a docent, which is just another mm -hmm. word for guide. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, you're doing that to show off that you know vocabulary, but a lot of people in Hollywood are going to have to stop and actually Google what docent is. And I almost did until I remembered, oh, wait, that's a guide. Because <laughs> I haven't used that, heard that word in context <laughs> in years, like literally since the university. So I'm like, okay, yeah, if I, if I had to consider for a moment to go look up what that word is, every single person reading this in Hollywood would have to do exactly that. They'd have to put down the script, be like, what the hell's a docent? <laughs> and, then, right. and then put it in. Well, put it in. In some ways that may be tactful because I do it every once in a while, you know, like I say Dauphin or different things. Mm -hmm. And it, I think maybe in her case, just to give her a benefit of a doubt, it may have been just to a little bit pull the person in for this character since we don't get to know her very well, but it, it put a little extra attention on her. But then again, I'm not the one who reads the script, so maybe it was aggravating. I don't know. It, well, it wasn't aggravating. I, I would just say that if you want to use, uh, what's, what's the term, like $15 words or something of that nature, throw it into a concept where it grammatically it fits to the point where it supports the def what the definition of the word would be. So in this case here, it doesn't really do that because she capitalizes docent Eve. And it's like, well, right. wait a minute. Her name's first name isn't docent because I don't never heard of a first name of docent. And if it is, that's weird. But I do know that docent means essentially guide or teacher or conveyor of information. Right. So I'm like, so this is done really just to showcase more her vocabulary skills as opposed to set up that this is her position here. Because ideally, especially when you're dealing with actors who, again, aren't very intelligent people by and large. There are exceptions to the rule, of course, but most of them aren't. When you throw a word in like that, they're going to be lost. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll give you that one. <laughs> so you just... So it's always, and it, again, you're also dealing with executives who are like, tell me the story as if I was a four-year-old. In which case, I take out my cheese and I jangle it in front of them and say, just give me money. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, because a four-year-old would it's actually resp respond to that. Uh, 
you know, even though you get some weird looks from those executives, whatever, they asked for it. Uh, but yeah, so aside from that, Eve, she's 80, she's in her 80s, she knows a lot about what's going on in, in this museum and stuff. She's very informative, but it's, it's basically just them and a the staff of two. And I've used to volunteer at museums. I volunteered at the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada. It was fun. Did their AV right. stuff. Planetarium was cool. Um, uh, it, well, they didn't have a planetarium at the time, but, but there is a planetarium further out. <laughs> different different thing, different project, different museum. Um, was connected for at the time, uh, at least staff-wise. Uh, rotate and, uh, between the two. Uh, but regardless, <clears throat> God, thinking about, think of all those fun things I did over there. Uh, but regardless, like we find out that you have the tour guide, Nate, or the park ranger, Nate, who's acting as a tour guide alongside Eve, and the groups are kind of split up a little bit. And we get introduced to this really cool little nerd called Dugan. And I, he's this guy that was so excited about this field trip. He's been studying up on it for months. He knows a lot about the cultures and, and stuff that's being explored here. And, and he's the nerd. And he's the nerd. And he's trying to get everyone to go up to the, the top mounds because he says, this is the most interesting aspect of, of this place. Uh, they just uncovered it. They just excavated it. It's open for tours. It's super cool. We got to go see there. And Pete is like, no, we're going to go to the village because I just saw my daughter and her boyfriend sneak off <laughs> into the village area. He doesn't Funny. say that directly, but like he sees that and he's telling him, listen, we're going to go to the village first, then we'll go to the mounds. And then Dugan is keep pushing back. He's like, no, they're so cool. The village, everybody's seen the village. It's like, no, 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 we, we're going we're going to the village. <laughs> and he just kind of <laughs> grabs them and shoves them over there. And as they get into the spot, he's now looking in all the, like, the huts and stuff, trying to find where, where his daughter's been taken to. And this kind of dovetails Dugan into Dugan in charge. Kind of leaves Dugan in charge, but this also yeah. kind of tethers into um, the opening teaser, which we skipped over deliberately because I think we I wanted to get for you guys listening a concept of who these characters were before we get into the actual supernatural part of this story. And that is oh, one more thing too. Go, go yeah, go I ahead. I did some research. This is an actual place. Yes, this uh, in is Illinois, an right? Tribe. Yeah, yeah, and they do have a. It's, we're going to probably talk a little bit about it. A actual, they found an archaeology, a stone that has a bird man on it. So she did her homework when she was doing this. I don't know if she visited the place or just studied it, but yeah, it's 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 pretty cool that it's based on some actual place. It feels very authentic, and I actually really appreciated that because all of her descriptions were very terse but they're very effective. Like I just, I was able to picture everything going on. Like I understood the layout to go, go through these gates. Here's the compound with all the huts and yep. stuff that's isolated off. Um, here's where the museum is. Here's the interior of the auditorium that they're in. And here's the exhibits and all the stuff. I was like, Oh, this is all great. I, I get it. I see it vividly. So the first page of the script, we're just going to jump back so that you have context is the excavation and finding this stone with a bird man inscribed on it along with mm -hmm. other characters. And it's like, ooh, very, it's kind of Raiders of the Lost Darky, you know, without a booby trap, but it's there. And it's like, this is important. And so when we come back to present day and they're doing the tour, there's these two dorks, um, stoner, cliche stuff. Yep. Uh, I forget their names because their their dialogue is kind of interchangeable, but I think like one of them is Francis, um, maybe. And... I, you know, it's, I was going to write them down because I'm horrible with names. But, yeah, they are kind of forgettable. They just basically got Beavis and Butthead. A bit more articulate than Beavis and Butthead. But, yes, they're basically Beavis, <laughs> Beavis and Butthead. And one of the things that kind of threw me off with this, it, and I think this has to do with, I think Rothschild is probably in her mid to late 40s. And the reason I say that is because some of the dialogue of these kids fits more with like a mid-90s, early 2000s film than it does with normal zoomers today. Yeah. There's there's true. a whole lot of bros being thrown out thrown out there. I'm like, I remember when I was in high school, bro was already phased out. That was not a part of the vernacular. <laughs> right. And it, I never heard it for any of my godchildren when they were going to school. Uh, except for like you no know, middle school, like you no know, grade five, six type of thing. And then it was gone by by the time you got to high school. But um but yeah, we got these type of stoner kids like, you know, the Sean William Scott and um, Ashton Kutcher from Dude, Where's My Car type deals, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought were painted quite well. And all they were doing is they get a Sharpie mark and they're just drawing penises on stuff. And, you know, it's annoying Mr. Truitt, the, the history teacher. But they wander off because Pete's not supervising them. He's They're part of Pete's group and Pete's looking for his kid. So they wander off and they 
and and this is the the part the big flaw that I, I mentioned earlier with it comes to the context of this of this um, museum is that those two guys they wander off and then they enter a research laboratory that says do not enter staff only and I know that when a museum is closed down all those doors are locked for precisely security reasons so this door should not be open but it is it's unlocked it's easy to enter into and I'm like okay that's that's really stretching my suspension of disbelief here because I'd rather prefer it if these are like stoner troublemaker kids that get into stuff. I'd rather you just have them pick the lock and then open it and get in there because right, I could believe that. Right. No, right. no, not just, oh, the museum's left open. It's like, no, no, if this is closed down on Monday and you know you have students coming in, you lock everything that those students are not supposed to be going into. Like, <laughs> you just teenagers. do. You got to lock it down. <laughs> I mean, I remember doing that. I remember doing that right before I started college. I worked at the planetarium. And on the one day that they were closed down where they were going to do a high school trip, we had we were given a, a layout of where all the kids were going to be going. And if they were not on that layout, all those doors were locked. Yeah. And that was it. You had to make sure they were locked. And I'm like, okay, this seems like standard operating procedure. But for the convenience of the story, they, the door is easily open. I think it would have been better if they, if they picked the lock because the whole reason of going in here is they see some sort of artifact inside that they think looks like a bong. And they want right. to smoke from it. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, very early 2000s, but probably still Zoomery. I mean, again, some things like that happened in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So I, yeah. I guess that's probably a, a universal truth now, spawning from the, the mid-20th century, probably till the end of time, uh, <laughs> given the, the curtain, the, the way society is when it comes to recreational pharmaceuticals. And um, so, yeah, they get inside. They're, they're drawing on stuff. They're playing around with things. And then they find the tablet that is found in the opening. And they get startled by Mr. Turret and drop the tablet and it breaks open. And as Mr. Turret is berating them, this black smoke snakes out of the tablet and it makes a beeline with that first you think is one of the students, but then it kind of banks around him and then goes right inside Mr. Truett and possesses his body and has magical powers where he's able to levitate and he's able to use like the force to grab a fire axe from the wall and, and it enters his hand like Thor's hammer and he just starts swinging it at the kids and they just make a break for it. And I'm, and I'm laughing. I'm thinking, this is great. This yes. is, this is yes. like evil dad, Sam Raimi level stuff. <laughs> um, it, it's, it, it's a fun twist that doesn't stretch credulity because we're, we're being set up that this is a supernatural event of a comedy. And I was all on board. Like, what? Well, please share, share some of your, your thoughts on on this section here and, and where it went oh, well, from there i i'm just trusting that my dog may get a little out of hand barking so forgive me about that but no worries no i i thought you know what the kids broke it why didn't that fog go to them and it gets explained later on but i i thought you know what i know exactly what's going to happen but dang this is cool i you know it was it is one of those things where you read it and you go i've I, I understand what's going on, but the setting's different, and you know the kids are acting like kids, and there's always going to be that pair or group. And I tended, I didn't destroy things, but I was the one who always snuck off and broke into places and things. Um, so I understood exactly what these kids are going through, and it's not just that Pruitt got possessed, but it was all the lies that they did to cover. Oh, I accidentally bumped into it. We were in a place <laughs> that was totally open, you know, explaining away how they had broke the tablet and what had happened you know they have to cover the truth with a lie when they go running because they've got this mr truett turned into this ghost possessed axe man um so no i was digging it i i was i was laughing really hard because the one kid all he wanted to do was smoke the bong while the other one was trying to draw a penis on a tablet <laughs> yeah and i mean i also like the fact that he's like yes the penis was there when we got here uh <laughs> It's like someone else did it. Uh, I was like, okay, that's that's fair. I I, I knew kids like that. Um, and, and as soon as this happens, like you know, the sto- a storm starts to cover uh, yes. know, the compound. Every, it starts raining and hailing, so everybody gets indoors. So everybody's now contained into the auditorium. And you know, as these two kids run in and, and blabber about Mister Turret trying to kill him, the chaperones obviously don't believe him. So when they go to the room, what ends up happening uh, with Nate? Uh, you know. Ranger Nate, uh, he leads in there to try and get some answers. They find Turret, and he's on the ceiling crawling around like a spider. He then freaks out everybody, and 
and in the most very robocop style of way, Turret slams the axe, splitting Nate's head <laughs> in two. And then Michelle's like, oh my god, do you think he's dead? Because <laughs> like, <laughs> like, she's completely panicked. I mean, it's trauma. And of course, Lindy, the laid-back mother, is like, well, I'm pretty sure he's... He's not going to be smiling the same way anytime soon. Like there, I mean, there's there are jokes, inappropriate jokes, but are, they're all kind of executed to m- the measured level of panic that each of these um, chaperones are in. And then we learn something actually very, very fascinating is, and that is, um, the spirit which is encased in this tablet can only possess a virgin. So now we've got this really funny joke that this Mister Turret, who's in his fifties and bitter, a bitter history teacher never made it with a woman was never married never had kids nothing of that and that's why it darted and banked around one of the stoner kids and went for the teacher because that stoner kid apparently has done the deed and you're like oh my god this is horrible why are why are there teenagers 15 16 year olds that have already copulated and it's like they're just making a commentary that yeah horny kids with hormones kind of over jump ahead uh beyond their their comfort levels or their their emotional levels and right this that one act saved that stoner kid's life essentially <laughs> so they're they're trying to figure this all out and they get to they get everyone back into the auditorium uh eve is scared out of her mind uh from witnessing the murder and seeing mr tour who who um was about to attack him until Eve uh, grabs it, grabs the broken tablet and holds it up to Mr. Turret, which scares him off. And he like runs away like a cockroach when the lights are turned on or a vampire to garlic. And as they put Eve down and like, Oh, you're okay. She's like, yeah, I'm fine. I just need to catch my breath. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And when they turn to Eve, she kind of just keels over and her face plants into the desk. And now she is dead too. So the two people that know any, anything about this museum are gone. So they have no knowledge now of what to do, what's going to happen. Uh, Cam says, we, why don't we just get back on the buses and drive the heck out of here? And then Michelle reveals, well, I sent the buses away because it was cheaper than than keeping them here for the three, four hours of the tour. <laughs> so they're not going to come back until much later. And, and so now they're trapped here. And of course, when they keep saying like, man, when the buses get here, they're going to be safe. It's like, I'm thinking they're not going to be safe unless they stop this thing. Cause if they just run away, it's like that thing's still going to happen. And we don't know what's going to happen right. as a result of that right. thing. So they're very short sighted parents. And I realize this is kind of their flaw. Like they, they, they're not looking for what's going to happen in tomorrow. Cause they're too busy with today, which is kind of a Zen approach. But at the same time, it's like, that's probably why they're worried about being a parent. Cause they're so focused on the now that they're not thinking about, well, how's this going to affect their kid? tomorrow <laughs> and how it's going to affect them in a year or a week, a week, a month, a year from now. They're just so overburdened with the responsibilities. And I thought, Oh, they are really tapping into the anxieties of parenthood. And I'm thinking, this is great. Um, I'm, I'm liking the dynamic here. I'm liking the fact that like Lindy is still kind of giving uh, Pete a hard time because of what he, right. how he commented on her son. And when he, when Pete realizes that, Hey, uh, Wilder, Cora, and Kelsey aren't here in the auditorium where all the other students are. I have to go find my kid. And so he's on a, on a quest. He's like, I got to just find out where she went. And of course, Lindy's going to join him because her son is missing as well. And then they get into like, you know, their argument trying to do get that way, get out there. And then as they're exploring the grounds, just trying to find their kid, they get attacked by like a demon wolf. <laughs> Yeah. One second before. Oh wait, yeah, I'm skipping over something. So yes, please go. Something too, because Michelle had um, when they were all getting there, she had confiscated all the phones, and I thought this was really good for two reasons. One, it solidifies the plot where they cannot call for help. They can't get the buses there. They're stuck on their own. But the other thing is, it in a lot of ways it's logical to make the kids focus on the field trip. So that was one thing. There's nothing they could do. They can't call anyone. They can't call police. It, it's they're self-reliant at this point. So I thought that was uh, a good thing that she put in there. It fit really well. It did. I was only missing one aspect, which was where did she lock the phones up to? And yes. like if she if she took the phones, she just like gave it to the bus drivers, like hold on to these, don't whatever. That, that would have made sense. I think it was missing that beat because I'm like, well, if Michelle took all the phones, it's like, well, we need to call for help. Michelle, where are the phones? 
oh yes like i they're in the bus it's like why would you put them in the bus or like because again what if the bus driver just number comes back right and then you lose all those phones so right. it'd be I, I i would like a better explanation as to where those phones actually were like if they, if they were in a, a guest locker and basically they could be like well nate the ranger has the key then you could set up something where they go to find Nate's body and his body's not there anymore. It's like, oh, great. Now we're stuck. Like, And I'm like, okay, or, there's, a, there's another aspect. Yeah. Right. Or like what you were getting into where they have these uh, beasts that were basically the native drawings come to life, uh, where one of them would be at the locker area where the phones were, that they would have to uh, either die trying to get past it or just have to do something else. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I would have appreciated like one extra side joke or, or obstacle to, to that, right. to solidify that. Um, and then, so once that is established and they realize, oh, we have to go on foot to find our kids, Lindy and, and Pete, uh, Lindy grabs a spear from one of the displays and she's going all badass cause she's in that, she's a former, you know, track and field runner and athlete. Um, mm-hmm. but she's kind of laid back, doesn't, doesn't care much anymore, but she's got some of the skills and we get it. Uh, and then the dad, Pete, he grabs a shield. And I really liked how this was written because he grabs a shield and it's described as super heavy. So it kind of weighs him down and he's trying to pick it up and it keeps slipping and dropping. And he does this a couple of times until he just says, ah, to heck with it and just leaves it on the ground and just catches up to, to Lindy. Right. And I'm imagining like this would be a really fun scene for any comedic actor to play. In fact, I know one of my best friends up here is an actor. I'm like, this would be perfect for him. He's the right age. He knows exactly how to do the beats to, to make that funny. So I started thinking of him as in this role. So that was kind of funny. But I, I like that dynamic. It's like, okay, she grabs a weapon. He tends to grab something that could be useful but fails. So he's he's not the dad. <laughs> he's not the heroic dad that you expect <laughs> him to be. He's just trying to make it day to day. And I like how while they're touring or, or while they're exploring the forest area to try and find out where their kid might be, they get ambushed by this demon wolf thing. And it this is where we get into the stuff that makes you really fall for heat for Pete as a character where you wish you you just love this guy. And that is like, he's, he gets tackled by, uh, the beast. Um, 10, uh, Lindy kind of like, you know, gets a, gets a stab on it, injures it. And then she's thrown back and then the beast jumps after her and then he tackles it. And then she gets the the spear and then stabs him or not, Pete stabs the the beast right. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> Oops. and then he's covered in like there is this kind of like black goo and beast blood and stuff and it really smells bad and it's gross and they're gagging and they're like trying not to throw up and I'm like okay oh, I'm thinking okay this is great you got you got a little bit of the gore in there but you also got the disgusting aspect of the fact that here's these parents that don't like germs <laughs> don't like to get run right. dirty and they're going getting like cl- covered in slime and and entrails and and things of these creatures. And so there was a lot of gagging. I did notice that there's a lot of gagging and even throwing up by Rishi at one point, which I thought was funny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it's really just down to the point where it's like, okay, we're trying to, we're showing that Pete is not going to have an easy time here. So this fits like my favorite rule, which is never make anything easy for your main characters. Pete gets like slashed across the arm. Uh, and it's the first time when they survive that they realize, oh, the fanny pack actually has some use now. Here, let me bandage that up for you. <laughs> right. And and so they pull out the flashlights and the fanny packs and they start looking around because you know the overcast is getting darker and and they they don't really know what's going on yet. And then they hear Cora's uh, voice echo from one of the caves and they go inside. They find they find um, they find uh, Cora. They find uh, Kelsey and they find Wilder and. They're, the dad is like, are you drinking up here? And they're like, no, and of course not. And because Cam has told these stories like, yeah, they've put vodka or alcohol in their water bottles and they just swing it back yep. and forth to go drunk and yep. fool around. And one of the things that's kind of funny is as they're berating each other uh, and, and dad is and Pete's trying to do the dad stuff and he grounds Cora for like a month and he's like, that's me parenting. I'm a good parent now. Um, <laughs> he, well, he, the other thing too is that I like about this is we're going from a really intense fight and automatically you drop into where he's remembering Cam talking about how terrible these kids are, the water bottle he's thinking about. And then he notices her shirts inside out. Yes. <laughs> and he calls her on. He's like, why is your shirt inside? Out? She's like, what are you talking about? It's always worn like this. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I like how that's going to be a callback for later. But, um, 
we we get this type of argument between uh, Pete and Cora where they're like, okay, we're we're not like I you're you're not an adult, you're still a kid, you're still my responsibility, all that type of stuff. And then what ends up happening is uh, Lindy and and um, Wilder and Kelsey see an opening into um, a cave that's knocked over by by Pete, just trying to like gather his thoughts. He leans against the wall. He triggers. Um, it was an a, Indiana Jones moment. Indiana Jones moment triggers a device that opens the wall, and it leads into a cave. And of course, Pete makes the Indiana Jones reference, like, "Don't go in there. If you've seen Indiana Jones, you know the thing will. If you touch anything, the door will close, <laughs> and they'll fill up with wi- with uh, water or spiders or snakes or something." And I like how that he was the only one that had that reference and no one remarked or acknowledged it. <laughs> they just right. go into it anyways. And then this is where they find like a very important aspect of the, of the plot, which is there's descriptions that basically show um, the fall solstice solstice. So, you know, the longest day and night of the, of the fall season and that this happens to be today. So when the sun hits this peak at this night, um, this this demon possession can open up a portal and and raise the dead and whatnot. They just, they figure this out from the images, none of the text, but just the images. By and they use like zombie terminology and and whatnot, based on like the stuff that Nate did and what Dugan said earlier. So they piece it all together. What's going on? And they're like, well, we just better get back and wait for the buses. And uh, and and so like, they get that information, and as they're and as they're walking back, Wilder approaches Pete and talks about his relationship with his daughter and says, listen, man, I'm, 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 you know, your girl, your daughter's the most popular girl in school. Everyone wants to like be her, be with her. And, you know, Pete's like, this is really uncomfortable. I don't want to have this conversation. <laughs> well, he's like, I just want to say, I'm not ready for that yet. Like, yeah, she took her shirt off, but I told her to put it back on. And he's just like, dude, I really don't want, this is the worst thing that could be happening to me right now. And as that said, he is literally snatched up by a giant monster snake, like an anaconda thing. Right. And it's squishing right. him. That's reminiscent from the room where he, they saw the, the person with the squiggly lines around it in a circle. So no, that's just, you know, gibberish. Embellishment. Embellishment something. <laughs> Who cares what that squiggly line is? And then, of course, Lindy says when he gets captured by the snake, that must be the squiggly line. <laughs> <laughs> and and what's funny is like she's using she she rummages through um Cora's backpack, Lindy does, and she finds she finds like hairspray of sorts and uh a lighter. A lighter. And obviously you get the the classic, you know, blowtorch uh thing going on here. Then she turns to Kelsey and she's like, Give me your water bottle. She's like, Why? It's just water. She's like, Don't play with me right now. And she's like, Okay. <laughs> and we find out of course this vodka and they douse the the, the, the snake head. And it killed the snake, which doesn't actually die normally. It kind of like just explodes into black bile and blood <laughs> and covers <Pete> right <laughs> into like a horrible mess, which is super funny. I mean, it, it, again, it, it, the imagery that's written on in the script is so it's so sparse but so vivid. You you visually it paints it picture in your mind quite vividly, and I think the hysterical aspect is Pete is coughing, trying to get his breath back. And he turns to Corey and says, why do you have a lighter? Like, that's such a dad, <laughs> dad yep. line to yep. say. <laughs> he nearly just died, but his most concern is, why does his 15-year-old daughter have a lighter? She's like, it's for candles and stuff, Dad. And he's like, don't. <laughs> that's not what Cam told me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that. it's just, it's really, it's quite hysterical. And so they finally, like, kind of make it back. But as they're making it back, um, Michelle watching the kids decides to separate the children. And the way that right. they decide to separate them is by trying to get the children to admit which ones are virgins and which ones aren't because, <laughs> because of the, this, you know, this weird spirit that can only possess virgins. And of course, nobody's believing them until these two girls that wanted to leave to go to the washroom sneak out. And then they find the dead park ranger. <laughs> Right, and they run back and screaming. There's this park rangers, but his face is split in two, and so that's when the kids start reluctantly raising their hands as which ones are versions, which ones aren't. And by the time Lindy and Pete, who have kind of reconciled at this point, get back with their kids, half the class field trip is on one side of the wall, and the other half is on the other side of the wall. The half on the other side of the wall is having a good time partying; they're fine, and the other half is really concerned because they realize they're <laughs> going to be possessed. They could be possessed by this demon. <laughs> and 
the funny part is, is that it is mentioned as to why would an adult, first of all, get children to reveal this information about them, and then second of all, separate them. And she's like, just so we can pay attention and protect the ones that are vulnerable a lot easier than the ones that aren't. And I'm right. like, there's she a was logic to this. With a tablet next to those kids, you know, it's like I'll block it. I'll keep them away from the kids. Yeah, it, but it's just it's so funny because it's like there's a logic to it, but it's so inappropriate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but this is how you do some funny comedies where you actually take something that's kind of controversial and be like, well, what's a, a logical approach to it, but make it also silly at the same time? Well, if the goal is that, you know, it's going to attack virgins and you want to protect the kids and you can't protect all of them, the most best way to, to the safest bet to protect the kids is basically have the ones that are virgins admit to it and go over in one corner so that they can be protected and the ones that aren't can are going to be fine. There's no problem. They will not be facing any any consequences from this this demon entity and it's like okay it's but it's it's still inappropriate but it's very very funny and so when they they get back into there they 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 talk about the the wall that they have but how fortunately it doesn't tell us tell the story of how they how these ain't this they ancient culture it, stopped right. this demon how it defeated it so that's what they turn to dugan with the tablet and be like hey can you translate this and he's like well i can know some of the symbols and he pieces stuff together and basically, it's like, okay, I think this is what it is, is that when the sun hits the hits its highest point on the sundial of the highest mound, it allows the, the, the demon to open a portal to the undead and raise the undead. But this story tells about how the demon was tricked with this tablet and that the, when the light shines on the tablet, that's where the demon goes. The demon is sucked into it. And right. so they're like, great. So all we have to do is make sure that we take this tablet up to the to the sundial part and do it. And it's like, well, and, you know, trap them in there. But that's where the demon kind of is right now, just waiting for the events to happen because he doesn't have to go anywhere. It's just a ticking clock for him. So, but they're like, well, if we go up there, it's probably going to try and kill us. So we got to find a way to right. trick it. And they fooled him once, you know, so he would expect this coming again anyway. So we got to do it exactly. And he also recognized the tablet and he scurried away from it. So he knows that if he sees that nearby, he's going to run away. So they can't, they realize, okay, they can't do that. So, Adega, please take us through what is Pete's plan to try and stop this. This, this is where game. the landscape gardener comes to the rescue, where he makes or he devises a way to make a heliostat. Basically, what that is is something that will turn to face the sun, always having the sunlight shine on it. And having worked with the landscaping, he says, you know what? Let's let's find the parts. We need a motor. We need reflective things. And we're going to put that up on the mountain so when the light comes instead of it being the tablet it will hit the heliostat and we can shift it off to the tablet and fool the demon and trap him as well so yeah it's that a very is... it's, it's actually a very clever plan all they have to do is aim where the the reflect the sunlight away from the sundial to wherever they're going to be with the tablet and that will activate it and right get the 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 uh the demon vanquished i'm like and i really appreciate this because it's a very simple plan. It's not convoluted. It's not crazy. The only thing that's convoluted is they have to build the heliostat. <laughs> like, that's yeah. it. But it's like, okay, well, that you don't have to worry about because that's its own little thing. The goal is we just need to get the sunlight to touch this tablet so that we can, and not the, the sundial, so that we can capture this beast, this, this demon. And it's like, and I'm like, that is easy to remember, easy to focus on. Continue, sir, please. <laughs> oh, no, it just... <laughs> There are times in stories, and, and it really aggravates me when there's little plot holes or, or bits and pieces of things that will not make sense. But in a comedy like this, when you're building a complicated device like this, and you're using pencils and duct tape, I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> so they divided up. Lindy and Michelle decided they're going to go to the... Um, gift shop. The, yeah. the gift shop and find anything reflective that they can to help make a mirror for the heliostat while Pete goes with the guys to go and get uh, the motor out of one of the animatronics so that they can build this thing. And in the meantime, when they're leaving, they have to leave someone in charge. So Michelle says, well, my my son, he's he's brilliant and he's a good kid and he listens to everything I ever do. So we're going to put him in charge. And so her son, what's his name? Sam? Sam, yes. Mm. They, uh, she says, all right, 
You're going to be in charge. We're going to run off and do some things. So you watch the kids. <laughs> now, like any good scene, when they shut the door, you see Sam look at Beavis and Butthead and they all smile. It's like, an, oh, she, he didn't know. <laughs> Sam's not a good boy. <laughs> exactly. So that we are left up to a mystery for the time being of that part. But while while the, the guys and the lady chaperones are off getting their supplies, uh, the undead part of the curse associated with this demon starts to activate, which case yep. uh, uh, Ranger Nate gets up, wandering around with an axe sticking out of his head, between his face, mind you, and he goes <laughs> after to attack the men. <laughs> and so that's, that's, that's its own set piece. It's quite funny. Involves archery. Um and and also competition between Rishi and Cam on who who's the better archer, <laughs> which I thought was pretty good. <laughs> and then then what we and get Pete gets injured again, only grazed, but he does get injured again with an arrow. Yes, he gets grazed by an arrow. So the poor guy, not only does he get grazed <laughs> by an arrow, he also gets like Nate's brains and guts on him right. as well. Just... Nate gets him, the snake gets him, the wolf gets him. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he gets doused with a lot of internal organs and 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 uh, and bodily fluids. It's quite. It, you feel so bad for this guy because <laughs> he yeah. probably smells horrible. Um, and Rishi had the solution. Oh well, we got handy wipes in these fanny packs. That'll do. Yeah, they finally remembered that and they just start cleaning themselves off like furiously. Um, and then for uh, Michelle and Lindy, they're doing their shopping and stuff, and then Eve appears, and they're like, "Oh, we thought you were dead. We're so happy to see you." And then of course she spider monkeys around the whole thing uh the whole gift shop chasing them and she manages to land on top of lindy and michelle comes to rescue her by hitting uh eve with a fire extinguisher uh the butt of a fire extinguisher and then smashes her head to smithereens (laughs) because she recites that you have to do that with zombies so that they don't reanimate and then was worried that lindy got bit and at this point here michelle does her breakdown and the breakdown is absolutely beautiful because we now understand why Michelle is like this. Um, she knows nobody likes her for her attitude. The reason she's involved in the school stuff is so that she can communicate with other parents because they would never yep. invite her to coffee or anything else unless she hosted it, then she could be involved. And while Lindy is trying to say, well, they don't actually believe that, we, we get a, a told joke. It's a good told joke. I would have preferred it more shown, but it's a good told joke, which Michelle's like, they accidentally CC'd her in one of their community parent emails and listed all of the th- reasons why they hate Michelle. <laughs> right. So she right. knows exactly why she's not liked. And of course, Lindy is like, well, maybe if we get through this, we can go have a drink sometime. <laughs> well, you're just doing that because you feel bad for me. And she's like, no, no uh, it's not the only no. reason, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I thought that was, that was nice. And then of course they, they return back to the auditorium uh, which, of course, is locked, and, and you know you have to get in with the password. And, of course, Michelle, who knows exactly the voice of the person asking for the password, says, I will tell your mother <laughs> if you don't open this right now. <laughs> in which case, they're opened, and they see a big party is happening inside. They're using the, the tablet as a luge for, for vodka. <laughs> right. And right. Sam and is the one the, at the out bottom. Of the two boys, the one, um, I, I don't, again, I don't remember the name, but the one's trying to pawn him off to one of the girls. You'll be saving his life. You need to spend some time with him. He's only had a blow. He, he oh, yeah, yeah. Help. Like he's only gone to like third base and he's like, and he's trying to get his friend laid to <laughs> save his life. And all the girls are just like rolling their eyes and walking away, which I thought was quite good. But then we see Sam is drinking vodka off the off the tablet luge and just breaking his mother's heart. And of yep. course he screams like, I don't want to die a virgin. <laughs> so, <laughs> and everybody's partying and stuff. And of course, you know, they have to discipline them all, all the kids, kind of get everything under under wraps. And so they uh they build the heliostat and as he he's as Pete is ready to prep it up there, he gets along with Lindy. And they kind of reconcile a bit. And he's like, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get it up, set it up there on the mountain. And then, you know, you guys will be down there and we'll need someone to bait the dude, uh, the demon. And Lindy's like, well, you know, you could die because I was just starting to like you. And I mean, it's an authentic and organic romance that these two are actually having because they're actually relating to each other over parenting and the difficulties of it. 
and Lindy, you know, admits that dating as a single mom is terrible. Um, you know, all the problems that she's going through. It was so nice to actually like talk to another parent, another person that was able to listen to her and, you know, not just try to use her because apparently that that's what's been going on through who. And, and Pete is like, I've just never been able to date anyone since my ex-wife because that was my life. That, that was what I was holding on to. And so they end up hooking up because she's, she argues he may not survive this. So he might as well. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's like, it'll be quick. And then they just start talking about how, like, Pete hasn't exercised in a while. He's got love handles. She's like, you know what? Right now, we just don't have time to care. And so they, it, we cut away before any action actually happens. But once everything is all set and calmed down, they go to the auditorium to pick up the last of their stuff, get ready to go. And Wilder notices that his mom's shirt is inside out. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and so he's getting really <laughs> upset by this. And we are going to end that part of the actual plot development there because the, re- the guys were getting into the third act. I mean, you can elaborate what's going to happen on, on the ab- abstract aspect of things because it's a, it's a movie. We, we know how these things kind of play out, but we're not going to yep. give you the details because the details of how it goes down are absolutely fantastic. I, I strongly recommend everyone to read this script. If you can get a hold of it, if not reach out to me, I will facilitate um, ways really for you to should. read it. But, Yes, that I I really love the character development here. I like the fact that this was actually a comedy. This is a good traditional style comedy. I think mm-hmm. a lot of the jokes, aside from a couple of references like TikTok and OnlyFans that are that are peppered in there, I think a lot of the other jokes uh, would stand the test of time very easily. And I I I think this this script should have been much higher rated on the list. Um, I agree. 40 was way too low for this. This this is, so far of what we read uh, of this year's, th- this is undoubtedly better than last week's script. So it should definitely be within the top 10, in my opinion. Right. Um, no, I completely agree, too. It's uh, one of the top two for me, if not the top one. Specifically because it's a comedy and everyone can use a joke. Um, and it's a comedy which is one of thing... 2023 comedy. I mean, an actual comedy of 2023. They're out there, people. <laughs> Right, right. Someone just has to um, put money towards this to make it. And I don't think this one would be that expensive to make either. No, this is like a $10 million film uh, easily. Right. Uh, right. Single location, small cast. As- aside from all the extras of the students, which you'd only need maybe a week worth of actual shooting with them, half days because uh, of age, of course. Yeah, I think it would be quite easily reasonable to, to do. Um mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, the the biggest crux of this, and that dealing, especially dealing with like teenage actors, you have to find some very very good young looking, of course, teenage actors that can pull off some of the stuff that, comedy wise, that's being done here. But um, like this this is a proper script. I mean, I I even think part of it could probably travel well internationally because the jokes are not culture are not 100% culturally dependent they're dependent on the relationship between parents and children and that is kind of a universal aspect. Right. So I think this could play right. in countries like India and China and you know non-English speaking Europe um I South America agree. easily. Like I just the the a translation for that would be not without it, much difficulty. Uh so my props uh kudos to um you know Sarah Rothschild she she wrote something that has that has jokes there's always the potential for more comedy especially if you get a, a really good and experienced proper comedic cast um to kind of amp it up a little bit but um that that's those are my thoughts there Adega, what are your thoughts before we get to the obvious rating of this script for for the well, uh, for the audience I thought there are some holes in it but they're quite and they're just minor. They're very forgivable because it's a comedy. Like something she should have played up on where Cam had taken a swig at one of the kids' bottles to prove that it was vodka, but instead he got a mouthful of Benadryl. <laughs> and there is a, a story there because everyone knows Benadryl's going to knock him out. With a mouthful like that, he would have been groggy. And they should have played, you know, she could have written something in there to where instead of him doing what he did, he would have been half groggy trying to do what he did. Um, but the way it's family oriented, 
you know, father, daughter for the most, or father, son, mother, son, and daughter. It's just, they, I think it was, it was it's a brilliant comedy. I, I, after the first page, it was just so dang easy to stick with, even with those little teeny forgivable things. And having a story where, for the most part, you kind of expected things to turn out the way they did, but it didn't matter because I was engrossed into it. And also finding out that, you know, this is an actual location. Um, I Yeah, I thought it was very well put together, very well thought out, and a breath of fresh air in a lot of ways because uh, a silly comedy like this is, is something that we really could use. Yeah, I think the the climate is right for it. Um, mm-hmm. The only the only way that this movie, if this were to be made a movie, the only way it would fail is if the production itself was not beneficial to the script. It's a very very strong script, very strong character relationships. Um, as I was as I said at the start of the show, this writer has a produced credit with Netflix for a movie called The Sleepover. That the trailer has jokes in there that would be funny on the page, but that movie is really. Um, heavy on the children aspect of it, which I think is probably why it didn't perform so well on the, on the critic side of things and audience score side of things. This one here has that comedy and it has that same um, caveat. So if you can't find a really good comedic director and you can't find a strong comedic cast of adults to play these roles, it would, it would fall flat on its face. And that's, that's with any type of comedy. So this one, it needs to find that, that beautiful pairing between the script and the, the comedy itself. Um, like, I mean, if Billy Wilder or someone were like him alive today was around, they could nail this a hundred percent. No problem. Uh, so I don't know if there's a director out there that's like Billy Wilder that could do that. But regardless, I, I, I really enjoyed this script. It was a breath of fresh air. Um, the chops for Sarah, who doesn't have a whole lot, lot of writing credits to her name, but by doing like 117, 120 page script that feels like a 90 minute film, uh, that takes skill. That is no easy accomplishment. So yeah, I, for me, um, you know, I, I really liked it. So Adega, this, this is a green light for you, not a pass, correct? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is a very solid green. Uh, the changes could be very easy. You could extend it. Like I said, with the Benadryl incident or, uh, when the tablet was broken and, the guy started speaking curses. It could have been in like an ancient Indian dialect as close as they can approximate, you know, and have a little translation issue there as well. But no, this, this should have been done. I I think uh, it's very, very solid. I'm very happy. I read it. Me too. I give this a green light as well. Uh, I am hoping that Sarah Rothschilds and her, her agency can actually land production for this. Cause again, this is from last year's 2023 blacklist, which means it was submitted to be rated uh, and ideally to be shopped around to be put into production. Um, I don't know if there's any executives out there listening to this. I doubt it, but if they do come across it, you've got two people right here who uh, are, would love to see this put into an actual film. And yes, I, I think it'd be, and again, there's very little work to be done on the script to make it film worthy. It is already there. And this is one of the few scripts we've had on the show where I didn't find a spelling or grammatical error at all in any of it, which exactly. is so refreshing. So you could tell that this this woman put in the work. Um, yeah, this is a green light. Guys, go, if you can, seek out this script. Um, read you it. You really should read it. Read it, laugh. Uh, know that at least we have, there's this one writer at least is a little bit of hope for for Hollywood, that they're out, that talent is out there, especially on the comedy side of things, and um, I'm crossing my fingers that hopefully, like this time next year, we'll I'll read something in the trades that this script is going into production with a cast, and and I'll yeah, be looking forward hope. to it. I'm really hope. hoping. I'm really, really hoping. So, um, oh, and and thank you very much for for <laughs> I it was just a coincidence, but I uh, thank you for lending me on this day with this script because it was funner than heck. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping the more of them are like that because, again, um, I, I think... See, this gives me some insight with regards to the voting aspect. So, again, dozens upon dozens of producers read these scripts and then they cast a vote. This one had 10 votes, only scored 40. I think this 
is wrong. I think the producers made a big mistake here. Unless I agree. Unless from the next set of excuse me, unless the next set of scripts that we read are are funnier and way better than this, I'm I'm of the mind that this is is way too low on the list, especially given last week's terrible script. Swap them out easily in their positions. Uh, heck, I don't even think last year deserved to be on the list personally. <laughs> it was pretty bad. Um, but yeah, this one here, uh, I I I think it's it's one of my favorites. It's not better than Bad Boy, which I really really liked, but for a comedy, this uh, much needed. So that's that's all I can really say for it, guys. Um, Adega, any follow, final thoughts before we call the show? The call the show. Um, no, it just, uh, again, it was, it was one of those things I, with the last script, you know, I thought, you know, if you read it, you read it. If you didn't appreciate the show that we gave, the ending was unique. And then that's the same with a lot of them where uh, you have these programs every Saturday and I'm deeply appreciated, but this is one where you kind of really need to read it. Give yourself a, a, a treat. Uh, and Again, kudos to the author. Uh, maybe some of it was because of that Netflix show that it didn't respond very well, that they thought, well, we, we have a record of it not doing as well as we thought, so this one may not work. But uh, nah, th this is gold here, I think. No, if anything, I think she learned something from that previous script and then made this, and this one is stronger for it. Um, yeah. So yeah, those that's it, guys. That's the That is the show. Um, scripts on Saturdays, double green light for chaperones written by Sarah Rothschild. Congratulations to her on that. I mean, it may not mean yes. much overall in the grander scheme of things, but I hope, um, I hope this actually goes into production because this is, uh, and I hope that's authentic to the script because this is something I'd be more than proud to, to promote and get people to support and see, cause it's very funny. It's got a lot of heart to it and it's definitely a mm -hmm. type of comedy that we haven't seen, um, seen around in, in a very long time or at least in a in a market broad enough for us to to get on our radar at least so that's that's what i'd like to uh to end this off with um thank you guys for for listening so <laughs> adega again thanks for coming back uh, of course we'll have you on again um for for another script in the in the near future nah, it, it, i appreciate it this is just proof you like me the best <laughs> <laughs> uh yes sure why not for right now, I like you. <laughs> Sally Field style. Right now, I really like you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that, everyone, thank you so much for listening to us this evening. Have a wonderful weekend. And never forget, guys, when it comes to great story, it all starts with the script. <laughs>